Rail travel is one of the world's most popular forms of urban public transport. And right here in the heart of Perth is the latest state-of-the-art achievement. This is the beginning of the long-awaited Perth to Mandurah Railway. Welcome to Perth Underground, the first stop in the city's new underground rail system, a project which is heralded as a world-class engineering achievement. This concourse level starts under the Horseshoe Bridge and is linked directly with the existing Perth station. And with the start of the new Mandurah line, is expected to see more than 40,000 hoardings a day. If you're my vintage, you'll probably remember Mandurah as a sleepy holiday town. Great fishing, easy to catch crabs, sandy beaches, but all about two hours away. Now, just 48 minutes by train. The new track completes Perth's coastal link from Clarkson in the north all the way south to Mandurah. 105 kilometres in less than an hour and a half, whether it's peak hour or not. This is the 1205 service from Perth Underground, which links through the tunnel to Esplanade Station. And from there, it's on to Mandurah. A journey we're going to be sharing with you for the next, well, 48 minutes. The management of the Mandurah Line project has been an incredible balancing act, with hundreds of hours being spent on the planning, even before the first drop of concrete was poured. Giant building blocks were placed with a millimetre perfect fit. A new bridge was pushed across the Swan River. Millions of tonnes of earth shifted, thousands of plants saved and replanted. Two tunnels dug under Perth and more than 200,000 sleepers and 144 kilometres of railway line were laid. All in all, an engineering feat of great magnitude and a success story for the many thousands of workers who contributed. A major achievement for everybody involved. This is doubling the size of the urban rail network in Perth in one fell swoop. 72 kilometres of railway from Mandurah in the south into the city of Perth, ending with two underground stations which basically transform the entire way that people move in and out of the city and go to work and go home from work. Thousands of cars off the road every day, all of the beneficial environmental impacts that go with that, an asset that will provide safe travelling conditions for the city of Perth, the people of the city of Perth, the people of Western Australia, international visitors who come here. There has never been a civil engineering project like this one for public transport in Western Australia before. It is something that will dramatically improve our city and our state and everybody involved should be congratulated. Worldwide, the planning for passenger rail is based around bringing the rail to the commuters. So if you live in a high density area, there's a good chance that a train is going to pass pretty close by. However, Perth faces a few challenges compared to your typical urban city sprawl. We have about 1.3 million people, but they are widely spread to the point where our city's population density is close to the lowest in the world. Only three other cities worldwide have a higher vehicle ownership per person, and our love affair with the motor vehicle continues with more than 90% of all private trips made by car. The solution? an integrated transport system to bring the passengers to the track. The result? A rail spine running the length of the coastal corridor, linking the north to the south, with feeder buses networking the suburbs to the station. These services complement the Fremantle, Midland and Armidale lines and connect with existing suburban bus routes, including the free CAT bus service in the city. If you choose to drive, this is also an easy option with the majority of stations having large park and ride car parks as well as passenger drop-off zones. The best way to travel and save money is with the Smart Rider. The 105 kilometre journey from Clarkson to Mandurah will cost you less than $7. But with a concession, again with the Smart Rider, less than $3. It's now 12.08 and we're at Esplanade Station. This station connects to the Esplanade bus port and provides convenient access to St George's Terrace and the Perth Exhibition and Convention Centre. 
It's adjacent to the Swan River foreshore and will be a vital link to the proposed Mounts Bay development that will transform the foreshore into an entertainment and tourist hub. To get to Esplanade Station from Perth Underground, we've travelled 470 metres through the tunnel below William Street, an incredible construction project which we'll explore after the break. Plus, pulling apart heritage buildings just to put them back together again. In early 2001 came the decision to run the Mandurah Line from the Narrows Bridge down the centre of the Quinana Freeway. We had to present a journey that was better or at least as good as they could get in their motor car. The plan would require the construction of two new tunnels under the city, connecting the Joondalup line with the new stations, the Perth Underground and the Esplanade. Now, right now, I'm in the heart of the city, in the Eastern Tunnel. And it's incredible to think, but about 15 metres or five storeys above me is William Street. Now, in this section of the tunnel, we're very close to the intersection of St George's Terrace, which means the Bank West Tower is about 15 metres that away. Now, the tunnel itself was constructed in four sections using a highly specialised tunnel boring machine that weighed in at around 300 tonnes. It was about nine metres long, about seven metres wide, and it worked 24-7 during the tunnelling operation. The tunnel boring machine was built in Japan, shipped to Perth, then assembled down on the Esplanade. Ready to go, it was hoisted by crane, lowered into the launch box at the north end of the new Esplanade station and began tunnelling its way to Rose Street, passing through Perth Underground on the way. Roughly seven months later, at the completion of the Eastern Tunnel, the machine was disassembled, carted to the Esplanade, rebuilt and work began on Stage 1 of the Western Tunnel. Working around the clock, the tunnel boring machine averaged about 10 metres per day, with its best day peaking at 20 metres. Keeping the machine on track, so to speak, was a pressurised balancing act. At the rear of the tunnel boring machine are two hydraulic rams, which are controlled by an onboard computer. These rams push off the completed tunnel to keep the machine tunnelling at the correct level. If it's heading too low, then the rams at the bottom of the shield extend more than those at the top, pointing the nose of the tunnel boring machine up. The result? A complete success. Well, as you would expect, uh, building a new railway through the middle of the city introduces a lot of challenges, and in fact, the engineering complexity of this project would rank amongst the most difficult jobs, uh, certainly done in Western Australia, and uh, arguably in Australia. The exercise was performed very successfully with virtually no ground movement and uh, virtually no damage at all, so uh, we can rest easy at the end of the day. As for the success of the machine, well, it could be highlighted using these two 50 cent pieces. If you take the two coins and stand them on their edge together, they measure about five mil across, and that is the distance the gigantic boring machine was off target. And that five mil, in engineering speak, is considered well within design tolerances. As for the rest of us, well, a machine that digs through nearly one and a half kilometres of dirt, leaving a 744 metre twin board tunnel in its wake, well, I think that's just darned impressive. While the tunnel boring machine excavated dirt below the city, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a team of 15 people worked permanently on monitoring above ground movement. The team used a range of high-tech equipment to track more than 4,500 monitoring points designed to detect even the smallest movement. After tunnelling under these buildings on William Street, only two millimetres of movement was detected. Though there were a few hair-raising moments. The monitoring crew were hunched over their computers all of a sudden, all the instruments in all of the buildings went up by about 0.4 of a millimetre, down by 0.4, up by 0.4, down by 0.4 of a millimetre, and after about 20 minutes, came back to where they were beforehand. There'd been an 8.0 Richter magnitude earthquake in the Bandar Sea, just north of Australia, and it had taken about eight minutes for those earthquake waves to travel 5,000 miles down to Perth. We'd picked up the movement of those buildings from that earthquake, remote as it was. 
On the surface, work was complicated by the presence of several heritage listed buildings on both Wellington and William Streets. The facade of the Mitchell building was cut into nine pieces and trucked off-site for storage. In time, the facade will be re-erected as part of the 140 William Street redevelopment project. The old Wellington building, the first building in Perth to have a mechanical lift, had to be put on piles and a concrete reinforced floor put in. The Globe Hotel, built in 1884, is also being preserved in order to maintain these historic streetscapes. As with all projects, there were those incidents where the jaw drops and work stops. Saturday afternoon, merrily boring away down there. The first spoil that came out of the pile hole was dropped on the ground. And there it was, right in front of us, a child's boot from the 1800s and a bone. So, of course, again, where's the panic button? We had to notify the police, the museum, and a number of other regulatory authorities. We had five squad cars, 11 cops out on site. The area was all taped off, the site was shut down, the union were getting quite excited and the bone went off for forensic testing. About five o'clock that night we got the word back, cow bone. The first two stops out of the city are Canning Bridge and Bull Creek. But to get this far, both the Narrows and Mount Henry Bridges needed a major overhaul, marking the beginning of when thousands of Perth motorists started to experience the construction firsthand as they made their way along the Quinana Freeway. This is the northbound Narrows Bridge, and as it was originally built to carry cars, needed to be reinforced to take the trains heading to the city. As for the southbound trains, a new rail bridge was constructed in the six metre gap between the two Narrows traffic bridges. With the trains being 2.9 metres wide and requiring a minimum of four metres for the line, it was an ideal fit. Structural supports, known as piles, were driven into the ground under the river to support the new bridge. Once in place, massive 54 metre long U-shaped centre steel girders, weighing in at 94 tonnes each, were rolled out of the construction yard in Henderson and taken up the freeway. Over several weekends, the girders were lowered into place, a precision performance that couldn't be executed in high winds, with a result that was millimetre perfect. As work started on construction of the central corridor of the rail track, another major engineering challenge was being met at the Mount Henry Bridge. It's here that engineering expertise and lateral thinking solved what could have been one of the biggest headaches for the entire project, closing half the bridge. An innovative design solution meant a new separate structure was built on the western side of the existing bridge, which significantly reduced traffic disruption and disturbance to the riverbed. 26 sections, each 28 metres long and weighing 1,000 tonnes, took about a week to build and using a system called incremental launching were pushed over the river and supported by the new piers. To reach the piers, the orange nose is attached to the first segment and led the way slowly across the river. The sections were slid on Teflon pads to reduce friction. The crew at each load point prepared and placed each pad. Mount Henry and the Narrows weren't the only bridges constructed with consideration to minimum traffic disruption. Detours were set up on sections of the freeway as new overpasses were put in place. With all the bridges, the key factor was to ensure the traffic kept flowing. Our aim was to minimise or basically have no disruption for people and where we could achieve that using existing road space, that, that was great. But in other areas we needed to provide temporary roads uh, and provide other facilities to enable people to get where they're going. If we couldn't do that, we ended up having to provide advanced notification through advertising and that, so people could change their route. Canning Bridge Station, just six minutes down the track from the city, and in peak periods, trains will be running every ten minutes. Alterations were made to the Canning Bridge bus station to link bus services to Curtin University and local feeder buses with the new train line. Existing platforms had to be raised a metre to match train floor levels. As with all stations, trains pass by the edge of the platform, allowing only about a matchbox width to spare. That's about 40 millimetres. So there'll be no worries about minding the gap, which makes for easy access for wheelchairs and gophers. 
we don't want stations that are designed to win design awards. We want stations that are functional, that have a high degree of amenity and are there for the benefit of the passengers. We have in this entry building here, we do things like put audio loops under the tiling. Uh, so people with hearing impairments uh, and hearing aids can actually pick up the announcements. We have visual indicators for people with vision impairment. We have tactile indicators. We look at ramp systems and easy accessibility. We provide lifts at stations for people with any kind of physical impairment. And, and also we find that young kids and mothers with young babies and prams will use those, uh, those facilities. So the PTA's approach really is, well, this is not just about people with differing abilities, this is about universal access. If you get it right for everyone, then everyone has a high level of amenity and access. Next stop, Bull Creek Station. Just a further three minutes down the line and only nine minutes from Perth. This station also has services every five minutes during peak periods. It's built on the south side of the Leach Highway Bridge, which crosses over the Kunana Freeway. The location of each station and the distance between them is vital information which drivers know like the back of their hand. Driver recruitment and training began 18 months ago and after the break, Pip tags along with one of the newest recruits. A big success with bus, park and ride patrons, Murdoch Station is approximately 11 minutes from Perth, offering services in peak periods about every five minutes. It's on the south side of the South Street Bridge over Kwinana Freeway. Murdoch Station will be an integral gateway for public amenities in this region, providing access to Murdoch University and both the Murdoch and future Fiona Stanley Hospital. new B-series three-car trains have been acquired for the expanded urban rail network, some of which have been in operation on the Joondalup line since 2004. Built in Maryborough, Queensland, the new trains come with a $10 million price tag and a complex delivery system. The trains were towed across Australia on temporary standard gauge bogies to Perth. They were then fitted with the narrower three foot six gauge bogies, decked out with locally designed and manufactured seats, all ready to roll for the Metropolitan Rail System. Requiring 20% less electricity to operate than the A-series trains and capable of travelling up to 130 kilometres an hour, these are definitely state of the art. A far cry from Perth's first rail cars. <laughs> In 1881, when horse-drawn buses and push bikes on mainly unpaved roads was the fastest way to get around, the steam train was introduced, linking Fremantle, Perth and Guildford. This little loco here was the first one to operate on the line. Unless you're nearly 50 years old, you're unlikely to remember the last of the steam passenger trains. This big locomotive here was the main motive power along the line when diesels finally took over in 1968. So, Jeff, this museum contains just about every type of rolling stock that was used on the railway. Yes, Scott, we've got a good, good collection. Most of the operators have donated us what they operated and we preserve it as best we can here in, in this location. We're in a historic car. What was, uh, what was train travel like in those days? I would guess it was pretty slow and fairly bumpy because tracks were built to very cheap, light standards and as you can see we're sitting on hard wooden benches. Uh, this was second class, I think the first class passengers got the benefit of an upholstered bench. <laughs> and let's just say uh, uh, in 1880 a railway line was built down to Mandurah, um, how long would have this little train taken to get there? Well, gee, it would have been slow, it would have been pleasant through bush because there wasn't much settlement then, but probably about two hours of a fairly slow and bumpy journey, I would guess, in the days. Driving a train is as much about familiarity with the track as it is with the train itself. 
To ensure the drivers are up to speed with the new line, special training sessions were conducted on the Public Transport Authority's train simulator. Now, because of the new Mandra line, you've required a lot more drivers. And I believe you've had a lot of interest from across Australia and around the world. What's your selection criteria for making a good choice for a driver? They've got to have very good customer service skills. Um, we're in a custom, customer service orientated business, of course. Um, they need to have a, a good level of numeracy and literacy and very good communication skills. Um, they need to be able to talk clearly, precisely, um, because of radio communications in a, in a safety critical environment such as the railway. 100 drivers have been recruited to handle just over 230 additional services that will operate each week when the Mandurah line is opened. Driver training courses run for 22 weeks, nine in the classroom at Claysbrook, and then 13 weeks out on the track with a driver trainer. To be able to cope with the requirements of the job, the new recruits are put through their paces with an intense recruitment program, followed by the rigorous training schedule. Due to the nature of the job, there is a great deal of psychological and psychometric screening to see how recruits react under pressure. James is now four weeks from completing his driver training course and I hear he's going to pass with flying colours. Congratulations James, that's great news. Hey, thanks Pip. Has learning to drive a train been as exciting as you expected? Absolutely, and I thoroughly recommend it. I mean, it fills a void that a lot of people may not even know exists, but I would highly recommend driving a train. It's a little bit more than put it in forward and let's go to the next station. There's a lot of things involved. And I hear that the driver trainers really do drill you. Uh, they're absolutely vigorous, but they're very good. And uh, what's insightful to know is that they know everything that's happening without even looking. They're watching you drive, and they're totally dedicated to getting you across the line. And where are we now, and where are we headed? OK, Pip, well, I've shown you Murdoch. All right, next stop, Coburn Central. Coburn Central Station is expected to be the busiest suburban station on the Mandurah line, with more than 5,500 people boarding trains here every day. It's just 16 minutes from the city, and we'll see trains pulling in roughly every five minutes during peak periods. Built on the north side of the Belia drive Kornana Freeway Interchange, it's designed to fully integrate with the rapidly growing Coburn region and the new Coburn Central Town Centre development. It's also the last station from Perth in the middle of the freeway. From what will be the busiest station south to peak hour in the north, it's almost hard to believe it was 15 years ago the Joondalup line was open. Like all great projects, it had its sceptics, but look at it now. It's the end of the morning peak hour and the train is still full of commuters as we belt down the centre of the freeway at 110 kilometres an hour. The Joondalup line has been so successful that the government has already ordered more rail cars to increase capacity during peak periods. So ladies, why do you like catching the train? Well, it's comfortable, um, I can breathe, uh, relax, um, I'm not stuck in traffic. It suits me because of the convenience of actually arriving very close to where I work and the time factors aren't too bad either. It gets me from A to B and it can't take any wrong turns, I don't get lost. It's a good start in the morning. Yeah. It's quicker travel down this way rather than on the Mitchell Freeway and obviously much cheaper. It's hassle-free for me. I live 10 minutes from the car park and I just catch the train to the city. I think that having the train station and um, the parking close to where I live is fantastic. And also, um, I cannot drive in. It takes me 45, 50 minutes to get in in the morning. It just cuts out my day completely. The new B-series trains will be running from both the Joondalup lines and the Mandurah line. These new trains are highly energy efficient, having what's called regenerative braking. This means the trains actually put electrical power back into the supply network during braking, rather than just dissipating the braking energy as heat, as with older style electric brakes. The generated power, which is approximately 20% of the power consumed, is fed back into the Western Power Grid. There are, of course, risks associated with an electric railway. With this in mind, more than 45,000 schoolchildren have been targeted with a safety awareness program. After the break, we'll meet some of these kids and find out more about the awareness program, Don't Get Zapped.
More than a quarter of a million concrete sleepers were supplied by a local manufacturer to build the track for the new railway. The old tradition of driving in the first spike on a new railway is no more than that, a tradition. Today, that back-breaking work has been replaced by highly automated and precise track-laying machines. The 45-metre-long rig was relentless, laying 10 350-kilogram sleepers every minute, amounting to a kilometre of track each day. The entire track-laying operation was carried out within the median of the Kunana Freeway and the major roads to the south of the route, therefore requiring very few road support vehicles and hence minimal disruption to motorists. In the process, 27-metre-long pieces of rail were welded into 190-metre sections called strings for laying out on the sleepers. The long sections eliminate the clickety-clack of years past when the trains travel the expansion gaps in the old rail. Working on a weekly rotation, the track layer would progress along one line, then move to the other to lay the parallel section of railway. In all, over 65 kilometres of double track was laid between Perth and Mandurah using this technique. The track geometry is, is something that we have to take particular care of to make sure that the line is straight where it's supposed to be straight and, and curves constantly where it needs to curve. The ballast profile holds the concrete sleepers and gives it the lateral stability against buckling and other forces that would work against uh, safety. And the overhead line also needs to be at uh, good construction tolerances so that sparking doesn't occur of the overhead when the train shoots past at 130 kilometres an hour. Track laying down the centre of the freeway, along with environmental evaluation, resulted in Perth getting a set of blue masks. 230 of them, to be precise. The objective was to reduce the visual impact of the masts along the river foreshore section. The median in this strip is narrower and therefore required a mast with a smaller base. Strength was paramount, so steel was used instead of concrete. Whilst the concrete masts are left in their natural state, as the maintenance would be too high to paint them, the steel poles came with a colour range. After much debate, blue was chosen as the best option to blend with the surroundings. Another engineering challenge came at the Northbridge end of the works, where the Mandura line and the Joondalup line connect. While it involved the construction of a tunnel connecting it to the Perth underground platforms, above the ground, earthworks and track laying had to be done while trains continued operating on the Joondalup and Fremantle lines. In the tunnel, the track laying was done on slab track, where the bottom of the tunnel is squared and the track attached to the concrete. A thick rubber pad is placed between the rail and the concrete and acts as a shock absorber. Joining the strings of rail is also quite different. A contained explosion and intense fire literally melts them together. With track laying completed, it was time to add the punch. Overhead power lines to carry the electricity to power the trains. The lines carry 25,000 volts of electricity, which is 100 times stronger than the domestic electricity supply. Modern electric rail systems, they are designed, installed and maintained for complete passenger safety. However, with such a large amount of electricity, it was essential to implement an extensive community awareness campaign, particularly for children. Mount Pleasant Primary School was just one of the 80 schools from South Perth to Mandurah targeted with the Don't Get Zapped campaign. Have you guys been learning a little bit about trains? Yes! Now, what sort of things have you guys been learning about trains? The overhead wire is alive and dangerous all the time. If you get inside the um, fence, um, you could get zapped by the lines or maybe hit by another, a train coming the other way. Don't throw anything at the trains, otherwise it might cause an accident. If you have something tall like a fishing rod or a surfboard, you should carry it in front of you, otherwise it might... Otherwise, the electricity might jump into it and you'll die. Don't jump on top of the train, otherwise you can get zapped. The electricity can jump from the wire to something else, maybe you, if you get too close. It uses 25,000 volts and that could kill you. You should never take a shortcut. You should always um, cross at the paths where you're supposed to. Otherwise, if you don't cross, it could be really dangerous. This is around the trains are there for a reason. So if you see a hole in a fence, you should never climb through it because there's always a chance of getting zapped or hit by a, a train. Stay!
About 11 kilometres down the track from Coburn Central, the line heads towards the coast and hooks up to Thomas Road, which leads into Kwinana Station. We're now about halfway to Mandurah, and one of the great benefits of this new line become apparent at this station with a travel time from Perth of only 23 minutes. The only way to beat the peak hour traffic is by helicopter, but you still have to get from the helipad to the city centre, so it's probably going to be a draw. That's if you hang the expense. Quinana will be one of two stations in the area to be linked to the shopping centre and town centre by local bus routes. Taking the train line off the freeway and into the suburbs created the need for extensive community consultation and reassurance. Often, the new railway came close to existing houses. However, when planning a route through established suburbs, geometry was a key factor. The critical issue was the need to provide a 150 metre long platform on a dead straight section of track. Curved stations present significant problems creating gaps between the carriage entry and the edge of the platform and this is a major access consideration for people with disabilities. Of course, there are also limits as to how far a railway can curve. With these new B-series trains travelling up to 130 kilometres per hour, the maximum curvature of the track had to be strictly observed. Fitting all that into an established residential area required much research and resulted in one optimal path. With this rail project, we're recognising that Perth is now a big city and it's an international city. We want there to be this uh, connectedness, this capacity for people to move freely around the city, to move between home and work and recreation very readily. So the rail is very much part of delivering that. It's more than just the transport corridor. We've worked very hard to make sure that every station is in fact a, a hub of activity, that it's either a village centre or a major regional centre, that it is also an anchor for an activity corridor. So it's really about making the city shaped in such a way that there is more activity, more diversity and less car dependence. 29 minutes from Perth and with services every 10 minutes during peak periods is Wellard Station. It's within the Wellard Village development south of Wellard Road and east of the existing leader area. It's a model of the TOD, or transit-oriented development concept, which is designed to maximise access to public transport. Housing is built around the station, so most residents have no more than a 10-minute walk to catch the train. Good for your health, great for the environment. A very important issue, well researched before any railway construction began, and one we'll explore further after the break. Rockingham Station is just 33 minutes from Perth and we'll also see trains running about every 10 minutes in peak periods. Located at Ray Road and Ennis Avenue, this station has a rapid transit bus system linking it with the city centre and other nearby facilities. The next station in the city of Rockingham is Warnborough at the intersection of Safety Bay Road and Ennis Avenue and about 36 minutes by train from Perth. Warnborough is an area of great significance to the environment, so much care was taken to see that this would not be lost. Once the railway route had been selected, not a sod of earth could be turned until the entire project underwent intense environmental scrutiny. The environmental evaluation began about 10 years ago and involved consultants from a range of fields as well as community groups. The process identified 231 species of flora, 68 of which were weeds, plus more than 200 species from the animal kingdom, all of which needed to be protected. Discoveries included flora of conservation significance near the Warnborough station. And this is where the conservation plan really swung into action. This is an area that's been reserved as an environmentally threatened ecological community, inside which is a series of very unique flora. So unique that this threatened ecological community resulted in a major change to plans. We came to an agreement with the, uh, with the conservation uh, estate that we would preserve a small area of this unique uh, community. We reorganised the area here that we're standing in, which is now the car park. 
<laughs> so what we have here is a less than a hectare, but it represents uh, something which is over 7,000 years old. Thousands of grass trees and zamia palms were removed from the rail alignment and transplanted to a holding property at Carnap, where they were nurtured for up to two years. Many were replanted in the same general area, while they were earmarked for other community projects. Just off Old Mandurah Road near Warnborough Station is the Children's Forest. Baldivis Primary School are the local custodians of this community project that aims to educate children on environmental awareness. More than 40 grass trees were relocated in the Bush Tucker Garden, as well as along the main driveway, all with great success. Overall, the revegetation of the Mandra line involved the collection of 315 kilograms of seed from up to 100 different local species and the planting of 427,000 individual seedlings. We've just left Warmborough Station, heading to Mandurah Station, nearly 12 minutes further down the line. We're travelling at nearly 130 clicks now, and I must say, it's very smooth. Not just the travelling, also the safety. The steel rails on which the train runs are actually twice as strong as was required. There are sensors the length of the track. If a driver goes more than the speed limit, the train is automatically slowed miss a red signal and the brakes are automatically applied, stopping the train. The rail network has world-class passenger security and safety systems. Top of the list is the closed-circuit television at the stations and platforms, which is monitored around the clock. And there are also emergency buttons on the platforms to connect you to the central monitoring room. If you're waiting for a train late at night, it's a good safety tip to stand near one of the surveillance cameras. If you're in any danger, the control room will pick it up and help will be sent. <laughs> Transit officers with the power to arrest are constantly moving along the line to ensure passengers travel in safety from start of service to the final train each night. And extra lighting has been installed at all the stations. Managing the day-to-day -day running of the railway is an intense and demanding task. This is central train control, the nerve centre of the Metropolitan Rail Network, where trains are monitored on this giant display board here. This is Warnborough, and our journey to Mandra is tracked about here somewhere. And from this centre, train controllers are in constant liaison with drivers, keeping them updated with any changes to the schedule. Passenger safety and security has underpinned all of the planning on the new rail line, and it has been beefed up on all the other commuter lines, making this one of the safest rail networks in Australia. The highly sensitive and sophisticated security system is well advanced, and passengers can rest assured that their safety is a number one priority. this massive project all the way from the city and after the break we cruise into our final destination, Mandurah, and showcase a few local artists on the way. From Perth to Mandurah, each station features a unique display of sculptures and designs by local artists. This is the link to the concourse of Perth Underground, where the theme is wide open spaces and play on light. In keeping with the theme, these LED boxes are used to showcase different forms of motion and will illuminate various events across the year, such as the change in seasons. And so begins an eclectic mix of some fabulous art. <laughs> journey for under seven dollars and from here you can catch a train every 10 minutes in peak periods having visited most of the new stations the presentation and ease of access facilities are indeed impressive so with the Mandurah line up and running from tomorrow 
Public transport in the greater metropolitan area enters a new era. Already, it's a standout as Australia's first fully integrated public transport system. Mandurah now virtually doubles Transperth's rail network, with the total weekday passenger trips on the urban rail system expected to grow by 68%, which will see over 170,000 daily boardings in 2008. The Mandurah line is a world-class project. It is the largest single public infrastructure project in the history of Western Australia. And if you look at the nature, the size, the complexity, we think it's very special. I've been on the project for over nine years and some of my colleagues have been on the project for many years more and they've actually seen the project move from early planning through to the design, now through to construction and now finally operation. So for them, it's a very, very special project. And a special thank you to the more than 7,000 workers that have been involved in this project over the years. They range in all disciplines, from tradespeople to construction workers to professionals. And I think the, the wonderful part about this is that when we're all dead and gone, this project in 100 years' time will still be servicing the people of Perth in a sustainable way. Thanks, Brian. Travelling from Mandurah Station to the boardwalk is easy. Just grab the free Foreshore Express bus service and in six minutes you can be enjoying the treat of your life. Oh, a couple of ice creams, chocolate and vanilla. Thank you. There's a lot more hustle and bustle to Mandurah than the days of the sleepy holiday town. But it's still a great place to catch that laid-back holiday atmosphere. Oh, thanks, Scotty. <laughs> Um, Excellent. It's not a bad old spot, Mandurah, is it? Isn't it beautiful? It's got everything. It's got waterways, Great. beaches, lifestyle, ice Great cream. ice cream. <laughs> and now it's quick and easy to get here thanks to the train. Yeah. And easy trip home. Mm. It was fun. Let's, yeah. let's do it again. <laughs>